turn it over to Sam uh, Whittier, another uh, uh, U of U student who has been rotating with us this month. Thanks, Sam. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jardine. It's a pleasure to be here with you to share the podium with my, my fellow colleague med students as well as Dr. Welsh. So I'll be presenting this morning on a case of choroidal melanoma. We started with oncology, so we might, might as well finish up. Um, this patient initially, uh, so I met this patient in the plastics follow-up clinic, uh, but he initially presented to retina with Dr. Bernstein. His chief complaint was shadow and vision. He's a 19-year-old male who was referred for recent vision changes. He was seen the day previous to him presenting here in the Colorado Emergency Department with these vision changes. And three days before we saw him, he had these upper peripheral visual field deficits that, uh, that began with some blurry vision. He was not having any pain bilaterally. He was just mainly complaining of this pressure sensation along with these visual symptoms. And uh, he had a fever that he had mentioned the week previous. Overall past medical history, relatively unremarkable. A few remote concussions, normal viral illnesses, but no ocular history, no family history that was remarkable and, and no history of any dilated exams. His initial ocular exam uh, was relatively non-concerning except for this right superior visual field defect. And on slit lamp and fundus, pertinent findings, he did not have any scleral invasion at that point, no noticeable pigment changes, his angles were normal, and uh, there was a large inferior pigmented mass with some surrounding subretinal fluid, a few drusen, no, no hemorrhage. A little bit of background on uh, uveal melanoma, and I won't belabor this because I know we've heard this very thoroughly today. It is, of course, the most common primary ocular malignancy, incidence of about five per million. It does have a predilection for Caucasians in their fifth and sixth decade of life, as we heard earlier. Primarily posterior uveal uh, tumors, about 15% anterior. And then I think Dr. Welsh's rule of five is probably best used for the rate of metastasis. Uh, seems much more sophisticated. And then about 85% five-year survival rate. As far as signs go, it's, it's worth mentioning that most of these are picked up just on routine exam. And they're not presenting with symptoms, especially given the age that they present. But you may see a subretinal um, raised posterior pole lesion. And uh, symptoms can be anywhere from asymptomatic up to nonspecific visual symptoms, even increased ocular pressure with more anterior lesions is, of course, they affect that trabecular meshwork. Differential, uh, given the fact that most of these are found on routine exams, can range, of course, from benign nevi, vascular lesions, all the way up to metastatic lesions, and of course, vary depending on anterior versus posterior lesions. Following these patients, it typically involves some serial fundus photography to characterize them and monitor for, for growth, but a standard seems to be the same B ultrasound. This low to medium internal uh, echogenicity is this buzz phrase we look for on B ultrasound. Uh, FA is less commonly used, but can be useful for characterizing low risk lesions. And histology wise, either status post nucleation or less commonly FNA, uh, we may see that. Uh, you know, we see some epithelioid or spindle-shaped shells in these spindle-shaped cells. However, most of them are actually mixed. So this is back to the case. This is fundus photography. We can appreciate a pretty significant inferior mass here. We see some pigment changes on, uh, on both of these here. These are both right eye uh, as well as some subretinal sub fluid. Here's a great montage Glenn put together. We can appreciate, again, the size, uh, some pallor there, and of note, this patient's macula was attached this time. This is optos, and here we can more appreciate that <laughs> dome-shaped appearance that's typically associated with uh, a poor prognosis as well as some of those pigment changes on the patient's right. On B ultrasound, again, posterior lesion here, we can see that there's no scleral extension. Uh, it was initially characterized at about 14 by 14 millimeter diameter and uh, was mentioned that there was spontaneous vascularity that was appreciated. A ultrasound unfortunately did uh, reflect this medium reflective uh, echogenicity here that we can see just posterior to the retina. 
So generally speaking, stepping back away from the case, again, observation is reasonable in smaller lesions. And uh, that was very articulated uh, with Dr. Welsh's talk earlier, so I won't belabor that. But the overall goal is to prevent metastasis, right? That mantra of, of that, that Bible to pre preserve life first and foremost. Three areas of therapy currently, brachytherapy, radiation therapy, and enucleation. And that depends on, of course, the size of the lesion, the level of structural involvement, and of course, visual impairment, and, and ultimately patient preference. And there's a, there's a plaque there and a plaque placement. So this patient's findings were consistent with a choroidal, metast or choroidal melanoma without metastasis. And given his options, he chose to be referred to Will's Hospital in Philadelphia, and I did not choose this case prior to knowing the <laughs> schedule today, so this is very interesting. Uh, but he saw Dr. Shields first and uh, experienced radio plaque radiotherapy in November, and he was staged at 3A. Per Dr. Shields' recs appropriately, uh, appropriate metastatic screening was overall unremarkable. And as mentioned, these lesions have a tendency to metastasize to the liver hematogenously. Thankfully, this patient did not have that metastasis and his labs were normal. He came back to retina and saw Dr. Bernstein here in late December. Um, and we, we pretty well knew the interval history, but his Colorado ophthalmologist referred him back for a non-healing spot on his eye. Yeah, he was dilated when he presented. We weren't able to assess his visual acuity. Still had that right superior pill defect, and uh, at that point seemed to be healing okay over that plaque, and had at that point a, a large inferior serous retinal detachment that Dr. Bernstein made the decision to not surgically intervene at that time. His genetic analysis was relatively bleak. Uh, the, the findings that are consistent with the poor prognosis of chromosome three, as well as the increased expression of 8P were consistent with his, his uh, biopsy. He was deemed high risk with uh, over 50% recurrence expected and recommended regimen uh, of imaging follow-up for five years. In uh, subsequent uh, care <coughs> at Wills, he was entered into a clinical trial and put on Sutent, the chemotherapeutic tyrosine kinase inhibitor that uh, was, was shown in a retrospective review at Wills from 2007 to 2013 to decrease recurrence risk by 10 to 20 percent with a uh, mortality hazard ratio of, of 0.53. So he was started on that, still on that, and uh, after experiencing the expected chemo, side effects, his eye became more painful. This is a young guy. He decided to undergo nucleation, um, which was done successfully. A medpore implant was placed. I saw him in plastics follow-up. His iris conformer was in place. He had great movement. He was not in any pain. He was happy, smiling, and, and uh, really doing quite well. Going forward now, this patient is being treated at UC Health. They had a very small amount of biopsy left, and they're building him a tumor-specific vaccine, so gene-directed therapy. He's patient number one in this trial. It's been used in breast and prostate and other uh, uh, experiments in animal models, and so he seems pretty excited about that. In fact, uh, there may be a special released on this patient if you, if you pay attention. So his course is to be continued based off of that last slide. Overall takeaways, of course, most of these are picked up on routine exams, except in this patient, given that he doesn't meet the, the, the standard fifth to sixth generation of life presentation. First goal, prevent or preserve life, prevent metastasis, the three areas of treatment according to our standards of care right now. Sense of follow-up even in non-metastatic diseases we saw in this patient, and as we saw there at the end, novel therapies are on the horizon, which is part of the reason I chose this case. Those are my references. I just want to say thank you for letting me rotate through. Working with everyone has really been extraordinary. I appreciate it.